it is great to see you guys. Go ahead before you get too comfortable. Take a second, greet your neighbor. Stand up, give him a fist bump, a high five, a handshake, a hug. You know the real, the drill. If you're new to Ignite, we do this just to have a moment to touch someone. If you're watching online, hey guys, thanks for being with us. Air fist, air bumping you. So glad that you're here as well. Front row guys, good to see you guys. Hey, what's up, Andrew? Hey, hey, Lucia, how you doing? Hey, brother, good to see you, man. Uh, it is good to be back with all of you. Um, before we uh, jump into week two of Ripple Effect, I do want to say a huge thank. Uh, thanks to Pastor Chris for taking week one. Um, can we just say thank you? To, he brought the word and he brought it incredibly well. If you weren't, if you were not with us, um, he started off the Ripple Effect talking about the Good Samaritan and about how we get to decide how big our circle of influence is, how big our ripples are. And um, I, I saw that at one point he was laying down on the stage, but uh, he, did an incredible, he did an incredible job. It was, it was, uh, it was powerful, and I'm just so thankful um, for uh, him starting us off. Um, if you were wondering where I was, um, I, don't even, I don't even remember if you mentioned that. He probably did. Um, I was actually down in Florida last week with the Timothy Initiative uh, just to, to, to share a little bit of some of the incredible things God is doing uh, through that ministry that we're a huge part of. And I know it's kind of a behind the scenes thing. We don't talk about it maybe as much as we need to. Some of you think I probably talk about Timothy Initiative too much, um, but they're literally uh, changing the world. And we, we are a huge, huge part um, of, of that ministry and walking with them. And so I got, I got a report I wanted to bring from you and I wanna make sure I get the numbers right. So I'm actually gonna read it. I, I try not to read a whole lot in front of you guys. And if you're watching online, I don't want to read in front of you, but this is just the, the numbers. They sound ridiculous. They sound made up. They sound fake. They sound like the book of Acts. Um, but I'm telling you, it's real. And the more involved I get in this ministry and the more I see the integrity with which they do everything, like, I, I, I have drunk the Kool-Aid and I really do believe it. And, and I want you to believe it and I want you to celebrate it. So this is what Timothy Initiative has been able to see happen this year. And again, Ignite Church, you are part of that by praying, by giving, um, and by, uh, by serving along with them. They have seen this year 23,953 churches planted just this year. And, and, and if you're wondering what a church is, it's 10 people or more. Yeah, we can celebrate 10 people or more coming together uh, regularly to study God's word, to be discipled. They've seen 121,795 uh, new, what they call Timothys. These are church planters. And so they're training um, 121,000 church planters to go out and plant more churches. Men and women who feel called by God to go out and reach areas where the gospel is not spread. They've seen 361,536 new disciples of Jesus, new confessions of faith just this year. Yeah, we can celebrate that. And... And they've seen 21,858 widows and orphans who had no one caring for them. Now the churches in their local area are totally taking care of their needs and caring for them. And I got one more. And this one's excited. For, for those in the mission area, this is really excited. I, I know we don't talk a whole lot about unreached people groups at Ignite. If you don't know, even know what that is, there are places in the world where you can want to know about Jesus, but there is no one to tell you about Jesus. I mean, like, they, you, can, you, can, you can be born, you can grow up, you can live your life and you can die and you've never heard the name of Jesus. There are, there are, now here in Greenville, it's hilarious. You can't go 10 feet without bumping to a church. Everybody says, amen, like, right? Like, most of the world is not like that. And, and, and there are lots of places where you can live your whole life and never even have a chance to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so this year, they were able to reach 52 unreached people groups. And that means people that never had a chance to hear of Jesus, now they have a chance to hear of Jesus. And we should celebrate that too. Um, so it was really, really, really amazing. Always inspiring to, to be with them. Um, again, if you haven't checked out Timothy in this year, please, like, it will encourage you. If you're a follower of Jesus, just, this will encourage you. If you're a skeptic of Jesus, this will confound you. And so either way, go and look it up. TTI Online is, is their website. Uh, go, go and check it out. Um, man, the world is being changed. God is doing incredible things, and we are a part of it. And, and, and the leader of it, his name is David Naomi. He's come a couple times. He wanted me to tell all of you, thank you. Thank you for praying for them. Thank you for giving to them. Thank you for generosity to them. Um, they're seeing lives changed. And it is a huge, huge part of that. Okay, with no further ado, if you haven't already, go ahead and pull out uh, your phone. We are digital here, and uh, uh, we want you to be connected to everything we're talking about. And so we want you to get our app. If you don't have our app, you can get it on the iOS store. You can get it on the Google Play store, Ignite Church, black and white logo. Um, my outline's gonna be there. We are in week two of this incredible series we started called The Ripple Effect. Um, and, and Pastor Chris kind of laid the foundation for us that what we do, what we do, it ripples 
out into the lives of others. It changes other people's stories. It changes other people's experiences. Not to get too uh, metaphysical, too deep, too philosophical with all of you, but a lot of times when we do things like our equip classes and you know, talking about the deeper matters of theology, people ask me about free will and predestination, about you know, human destiny. That's one of those things. When you start delving into the deeper things of like God, you start to wonder, like, you know, do our choices matter? Does God already know everything? Like, you know, what meaning does our li- life have? And so here's my simplistic explanation for it, and I know that there's gonna be all kinds of holes if you want to find them in this, but, I, but this is really kind of how I, I view this particular matter. God has carved out a river of history, and the truth is you and I do not have the power to move the river. We're not gonna change the river's flow. God already sees its beginning. He already knows its end, and it's moving, and we're in the midst of it. But what we can do, what we can do in the river is we can make a ripple. We can make a ripple. And, and some of you are like, well, that doesn't sound too impressive. I mean, the river isn't going to change because of a ripple. No, when, when, when you throw a rock into the river, the river's different forever because of that rock. You move things. You've shifted things. You slightly adjust courses. You, you have, the, the, the water around that moment will never, ever be the same. And so you and I, yeah, we don't have to worry about the river of history. That's God's. He can worry about that. We can worry about making a ripple. We can make a worry, and I want us to, as a church, be worried about making the biggest ripple with our life possible. Because so many of us, we, we flow through life and nobody even knows our life existed. But we have a chance to ripple our life into the lives of other people. And so um, last thing before we just jump into our, you know, our story for the day, it's one that many of you know. Uh, one of my favorite Bible characters, I resonate with this guy named Zacchaeus, you know, he was a wee little man. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> go ahead and get it out right now. I'm not singing the song for you, but uh, before we do that, um, talking about rippling and living a life that does ripple, um, I'd be very, very remiss um, if I didn't take this moment. We're a church that believes in honor, and I know that some of you, um, you might not want to be a part of this moment of honor. You didn't serve so that you could receive this honor, but we as a church believe it's important for us to give this honor. This weekend was Veterans Day weekend. And if you're like most Americans, Veterans Day now is just another day off. It's another day to shop. It's kind of getting ready for Christmas. We say, yeah, it's just the truth. But the reason we have this day is to remember the reality that the freedom we enjoy to do all those things that we do on Veterans Day, it was purchased by blood and by sweat, and by toil, and by sacrifice. People gave, and people saw others give, and it's important that we take a moment to honor. So if you are um, a veteran, um, and you're here in the house, would you please let us honor you by just by standing up, just for a moment, will you stand up, please? And we just wanna honor you, we wanna celebrate you. We wanna thank you for serving our country, our community. It, what you do, it ripples. Thank you guys so much, amen. That, that moment of honor, it, it's not enough. But know that what you do, it has made a difference. And uh, we're so thankful for every single one of you. Let's jump into the story of Zacchaeus now in Luke chapter 19. We're just going to start off with just the intro, and I'll talk a little bit about that. It says, Jesus entered, and he passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector. And what we know about Zacchaeus is this, and he was rich. Um, it's kind of an interesting introduction there. And I know that for many of you, 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 you've learned this story, you know this story. Again, you've sung the song, you've danced uh, the dance. Uh, it's going to be difficult for, for me to bring anything new about the story of Zacchaeus to you. But I do want to take just a little bit and, and kind of get into the weeds of this story because this is a powerful story of life change. Um, that we see in the New Testament. There's a reason why we teach it in Sunday school. There's a reason why many of you grew up, you know, looking at those old posters, I don't know if you remember, or those old felt boards with Zacchaeus, you know, stuck up in a tree. There's a, there's a reason for that. It's because this story is so powerful. So to get into just even the intro, just look at where Jesus is. It's, it's very, very interesting. He's passing through this city, and the city's name is Jericho. And, and, and I know not all of you are, are, are biblical scholars. A lot of you are, though. And, and every time I, I read that, it always takes me aback because the truth is, brothers and sisters, this city should not exist in the New Testament. Um, God's command to the people of Israel when they went to the promised land, uh, Jericho was the first major hurdle that they had to overcome. And many of you, again, that's another Sunday school story. You remember they marched around the walls of Jericho. They blew the ram's horns. They shouted, and the walls came tumbling down. Well, the intent of God for the city of Jericho was that the city of Jericho would be wiped off the map. But in so many ways, again, the Israelites represent us, and they didn't follow through with the job completely as God had told them to. And so the city of Jericho was rebuilt, and now it's still a part 
of the history of Israel, um, even to the day of Jesus. And so he's passing through this city that shouldn't exist. And, you know, Pastor Chris even mentioned that last week. Uh, This city was in the story of the Good Samaritan, too. And as he does it, we have our main character for the story, a guy named Zacchaeus. And here's the two things we learn about him. (laughs) He's a chief tax collector, and he's very, very rich. Um, This is the only time in the New Testament that, that that word chief tax collector is ever used. So Zacchaeus is a pretty big deal. There aren't many chief tax collectors. And if you're wondering what's a chief tax collector, a chief tax collector is probably the one who gets the money from the tax collectors. And so if you know the story of Matthew, the disciple of Jesus, Matthew was a tax collector. He, he got money for the government of Rome from the Jewish people. And all the tax collectors, of course, they were hated. Many of you know that. And the reason they were hated is nobody loves the IRS. And it's never, never. You know, and and even worse, back in those days, the IRS didn't have rules and regulations about how they took taxes, and so they overtaxed people. They really hurt people. As a matter of fact, the Roman government, they they wanted to keep people in line, and one way governments keep people in line is to keep people poor. Because if you don't have enough money to feed yourself, you don't have enough strength to rebel against the government that's in charge of you. So a lot of governments throughout human history, the the, the, kind of goal has been, this sounds so cool and callous, and it, it is, and there are still governments like this now. The goal is, let's keep people barely alive. Barely alive. Let, let's feed them enough that they won't die, but never enough that they're strong enough to rise up and do something better. And Israel's in a place that's kind of like that. You wonder why they're so passionate about a Messiah? People are starving. People are poor. People don't have enough And the tax collectors make their life so much worse. And not only do they make their life worse, but usually because they overtax people, they live, the tax collectors, they live luxurious lives. Zacchaeus in modern day, in modern days, if you saw my Instagram post last week, uh, uh, the hotel we were at, I was taking a walk to go get coffee for Jessica. I come back and there's this beautiful yellow Ferrari being valet parked at the hotel. And I made a comment about like, this is when you know that you're the place that's too rich for your blood. That kind of thing. Yeah, like, like, the tax collectors drove yellow Ferraris. They wore Brooks Brothers and Giorgio Armani. Their, their wives, you know, were sporting Hugo Boss and Chanel. Like they, they lived it up large in front of people who were starving. They were hated. They were loathed. They were despised. And when you know everybody hates you anyway, you know what you do? You just live more luxurious as it'll, because it doesn't matter at that point, right? You just show it and flaunt it more. That's the kind of guy our main character is. I don't want him, I don't want you to think, because most of you know the story, and we know what happens to Zacchaeus. Don't look at Zacchaeus for who he's gonna be at the beginning. Look at who he was. He was the worst of the worst, the lowest of the low, the most rejected of the rejected. And yet Jesus had his eyes on him. Some of you come, have come into this house today and you've had a hard week. You haven't got it right. You've messed up. You've made mistakes. Some of you, if you're honest, it's difficult for you to even close your eyes and bow your head in prayer because you're wondering, does God even want to have anything to do with me right now? I just want you to know that not only does our God want to have something to do with you, if you've had a tough week, he's got his eyes on you if you've had a tough week. Our God loves taking sinners and transforming them into saints. And for all all of you who came in feeling like you're spotless and perfect, the truth is when people think that they don't need God, God kind of turns his eyes away from them. He has eyes for the broken. So you can write this down. It's, uh, it's something that I, that I like, and I'll, I'll explain why. This is Andy Stanley, Charles Stanley's son, said this. What happens in the hall is more important than what's hanging on the wall. And, and, and the reason why he said that, that's for, that's for churches like us. You see, if you've ever gone down our volunteer hall, you have all these great you know, core statements of who we are, our belief statements, our core statements. And we, we say all these catchphrases that sound you know, really, really great. And, and, it's, and it's good that we know what we believe and who we are. And if you, if you don't know who we are and what we believe, go, go walk down that hall and you can, you can just read a little bit about our core values. And many of you know them. We, we believe you can't do life alone. We believe that we'll do anything short of sin to save someone reaching for Jesus. We we believe that our mission is to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. We put the next generation on what end of the bus? What end? The front end of the bus. Yeah, like we have all these things that we say, but what we say doesn't matter as much as what we do. And that's what that statement means. In other words, you can talk about how much you love your family and how much you value your position as a father, as a mother, as a husband, as a wife. But the truth is, if you're not investing in your family, then you can say anything, but what you're doing tells a different story. You can say that you care about the lost, 
and that you have a heart for those who don't know Jesus. But the truth is, if you aren't willing to have a gospel conversation with anyone around you ever, what you're doing doesn't necessarily match up with what you're saying. You can say you're a person of generosity, and I know I'm already, man, I didn't go long to preaching into meddling. I'm sorry, but I'm not really sorry, actually. But like, you can say you believe in generosity. <laughs> Till the cow comes home, you can say you believe in the kingdom and then, and then we should be given to it. But if you don't give, what you do is different than what you say. And look, I'm not, I'm not saying that for us to feel love. I'm, I'm saying that so that our eyes can be open to the truth of who we are and who God is. Um, it's when we see clearly that we can move things and shift things in our story so that we can go forward rightly. Um, and we're gonna see this incredible story of a guy whose eyes and mind were clouded by greed, were clouded by sin, were clouded by shame, were clouded by so many, like, and again, because Zacchaeus' life was not all roses and, 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 and it, was, it was hard. He was a loathed person in his community. But one moment with Jesus changes everything. And so I wanna make sure today that we have open eyes to see what God has for us. Let's jump to the main story, main part of the story. Ripple causing eyes. Here, here, here's how we have eyes that can see what we need to see. Number one, write this down. Ripple causing eyes, they see the seeking. They, they have eyes open to actually see people around them that are hungry to know Jesus, that are hungry to know God, that are hungry to know peace, that are hungry to know love. They're looking for opportunity and they're looking for people as they truly are to see people who are actually longing for something more than what they're experiencing in this world. Um, I'm learning. The more I have open eyes to see people, the more people I actually see. And I know that's like Captain Obvious right there, right? But can we just admit for a second that most of the time we live life in a blur of our own goals, in a blur of our own needs, in a blur of our own, what, what, like we go to the grocery store and we're there to just get stuff. We're at our job and we got a whole pile, pile of papers that we got to move from one stack to the other. We're, we're going through and we're taking our kids to 15 different activities, you know, so that we can be a good mom and dad. We're, we're living life at this pace and people just blur by us. You know, the people at your work and the people at the grocery store and the people at those activities, the people at church, the people sitting beside you blur into space. We don't have eyes to see them. And you can say all the negative things you want to say about Zacchaeus, but he had eyes that were looking for something. So let me read you a little his story. So this guy, Zacchaeus, Luke 19, 3, it says, and he, Zacchaeus, he, he sought to see, he sought to see who Jesus was. <laughs> But he could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see Jesus, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, Jesus, he looked up and he saw Zacchaeus. Now, now some of you for the first time, you've read the story a million times, but you're like, have you noticed how many times the word see is being used in this story? Over and over again, you have, you have Zacchaeus seeking and he, he saw and he sees. He could not see because of the crowd. Um, he ran ahead to see. Je and then all of a sudden it turns to Jesus' perspective and it's like, and Jesus is seeing him in return. There's a, a lot going on here about what we see and what we don't see. And to kind of paint the picture of the story, again, remember who Zacchaeus was. You have Jesus coming through town. At this point in Luke 19, he's a pretty big deal. Like people have seen a lot of his miracles. He is an up and coming prophet. He is very at the top of his game. He's very popular. He's very controversial. He generated crowds everywhere that he went. And now he's coming to Jericho and this guy named Zacchaeus hears about it. Now you're wondering, why in the world would Zacchaeus, his sinner, be interested in Jesus? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but here's, you wanna know what I think? I think Zacchaeus might've caught wind that there was his other tax collector, a guy named Matthew, who in Luke 5, Jesus looked at Matthew and he saw Matthew and he said, get up out of your booth and you come follow me. So this is a, this is a rabbi that works miracles that he wants tax collectors on his team. And that was very unusual, by the way. Most, most of the Pharisees, most of the teachers of the law, if I'm just being honest with you, if they were to have anything to do with the tax collector, it would just be to spit on them as they passed by. They were disgusted at them. Because tax collectors had betrayed the people of Israel to make a buck off of Rome. So it was easy to despise them. It was hard to love them. And I believe personally, you know, there could be a lot of reasons, but I believe personally Zacchaeus was very interested. I just want to see the face of the man 
Who wants tax collectors on his team? Because nobody ever wanted Zacchaeus on his team. Again, as someone who shares some of the physical characteristics of Zacchaeus, you guys are like, yeah, nobody wants a short guy on the team, right? Like, nobody wants, like, yeah, like, last for kickball, usually last for dodgeball. Um, you know, nobody, I, anybody ever been the, you don't have to raise your hand, everybody ever been the last, though, at something? And if, if ever been the, ever, anybody ever been the one that nobody wanted on their team? Well, if you've ever been that guy or that girl, to think that there is somebody who is looking for someone like you to be on their team, that's worth running for. That's worth climbing a tree for. Again, we take it for granted it isn't a big deal that he climbs a tree, but again, a Jewish, well, a wealthy Jewish man. Imagine again, imagine this guy rolling up in his Ferrari, gets out in his $2,000 suit, starts running down the street and jumps up and climbs a tree in his $2,000 suit. It's not something you see every day. Like he was embarrassing himself. He was embarrassing himself just to see Jesus. And out of all the places that Jesus could have looked, and there's a crowd all around him. It's like he has tried to weave through the crowd and people wouldn't let him through. There's a lot of faces to see. Who does Jesus see? He sees the guy in the tree. He sees the person that's really looking for him. You know, a lot of people wanted something from Jesus. So far as we know, Zacchaeus didn't want anything from Jesus. He just wanted to see Jesus. Not to make you feel guilty. Some of you need to write down this question. Did you come today to get something from Jesus? Or did you come today to see Jesus? Because it's a, it's a, it's a different thing. And, and, and it's okay to come. I mean, again, Jesus did not rebuke people who came to get something from him. He did not rebuke those who sought a miracle. He did not rebuke those that sought prayer. He did not rebuke those that sought wisdom and counsel. So it's not wrong to come to get something from him. But I do think Jesus so appreciates somebody showing up just to be with him. And that's who Zacchaeus was. What we look for and how we look for it, it changes everything. So we wanted to kind of illustrate that a little bit. I have here a pair of binoculars. Many of you, you know, have something like this similar. Binoculars are great for certain purposes. If you're trying to see something in the distance, oh yeah, there's just nothing but a blur. Oh, I can see the time really good, 10, 10 a.m. Oh man, I gotta hurry up. Okay, they're great. <laughs> they're great to focus in on something. But you know what? If, if, you try, if you walked around with binoculars on your face all the time, I'd love to see you drive. Wouldn't that be? Yeah. Why? why? We all laugh. Because why? Well, the, mo the more focused in on one thing we are, the more we're going to miss everything else around us, right? And so take a second. Um, we're going to bring the lights down. Don't worry. Power's not out. We're just actually doing this on purpose. Bring the lights down for a second. I have a picture I want to show you guys. Okay. So this is, this is a picture. Anybody know what's in this picture here? Yeah, a coffee cup. Yeah, this is a picture of a coffee cup. Um, a very bad picture of a coffee cup, may I, may I add. <laughs> not, a, not an in-focus picture of a coffee cup. And look, there, 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 that is a picture of a coffee cup. But it's also, you can show the next picture. It's also a picture of a lot of people worshiping Jesus. And if you're wondering where the coffee cup is, it's right there near that young lady that's kind of in the light there. It's, 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 it's right you can see it right kind of here, past it, yeah, right there. It's like right there. Like, so, yeah, you still didn't see it. It's okay. It's there. Like, <laughs> you can bring the lights back up. So here's, the, here, here's why I wanted to do that. What happens if all we see is the coffee cup and we miss hundreds of people surrounding it? I live my life like that a lot of times. So focused on the thing I got to do that I miss all the people that are right around me. So ripple causing eyes, they see the seeking. Number two, guys, you can write this down. Ripple causing eyes, they identify the invisible. Not only do they, do they have a broad enough gaze to, to see the people that are, that are seeking something from God, but when they actually see them, they're able to look and see more of the truth of them. Let me read you this story, Luke 19.5. It says, when Jesus came to the place, and he saw Zacchaeus in the tree, he walks up to the tree. When he came to the place, he looks up and he sees Zacchaeus and he says to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down because I got to stay at your house. And so Zacchaeus made haste. He came down and he received Christ joyfully. But when they, and remember they is the, is the massive crowd. When they, when the crowd saw it, they complained and they said, he's gone to be a guest with the man who's a what? A sinner. Again, interesting Interesting, interesting story. Jesus, by the way, is breaking a lot of tradition 
in, in doing this on all kinds of levels. First of all, um, in, in, in hospitality, Middle Eastern hospitality isn't that different than Southern hospitality. And all of you guys, if you're Southerners, now y'all Yankees, we just love you, but y'all do crazy things and we just give y'all passes on anything you wanna do. If you're a Southerner, you know you don't invite yourself to somebody's house. Everybody wanna say amen to that, right? Amen. That's just rude. It's rude. I never, I, I grew up in Beargrass, boy, I'd never go up to one of you and be like, hey, you're making me lunch today. You'd be like, no, I'm not. <laughs> Or you might be a good Southerner who just can't tell anybody no. And you say, well, okay, but like you're, you're really uncomfortable that I invited myself unprovoked over to your house. You don't do that. Well, Jesus shouldn't have done that. But I think Jesus is operating at a different level. Number, number two, I mean, the crowd's complaining because out of everyone that Jesus could have visited in this entire town, Jesus picked the worst person, the worst person, the mob boss, the godfather, and I'm not talking, I mean, some of you are like, yeah, that sounds awesome. No, not the cool Godfather. Like, I mean, the real criminal that hurt people Godfather. Like, like the worst person. And Jesus invited himself to go and spend time with this person. Why? Because again, out of everybody in that crowd, Zacchaeus was the one who needed him the most and who was looking for him the hardest. I mean, it's, it's, that, it's that same kind of thing. And most of you have heard the, Heard the story of the woman that washed his feet with her tears and poured the perfume on his feet. You remember that story? We at uh, Ignite Church actually wrote a song to that story. It's so beautiful about, you know, me poured out, poured out for you. And, and, and people complained then too, but Jesus explained like, hey, out of everyone at the party, she was the one that loved him most. And Jesus is saying, out of everybody in this huge crowd, the tree climbing guy's the one that loves me most. He's the one that's most passionate about seeing me. He's the one I wanna spend time with. Jesus sees things in people that other people don't see. Everyone else saw a criminal, and Jesus saw a convert. Everyone else saw Zacchaeus' shame. Jesus saw Zacchaeus' salvation. Everyone saw all the problems and pain that Zacchaeus had caused, and Jesus saw all the promise and the providence that Zacchaeus could bring. If you're wondering, by the way, what happens to Zacchaeus after this story, he becomes a bishop in Caesarea. He becomes one of the most influential figures of the early church. This guy who was known as a greedy criminal becomes somebody who spends the rest of his life leading people to Jesus. Pretty cool. So don't think that he can't do something with you because he can do anything he wants to with you and with me. This part of the story really reminds me, and we don't have a picture for this, um, but I don't know, any of you who are, who are a kid of the 90s, kind of like me, in the 90s, um, this was really popular, the, the magic eye puzzles, I don't know if any of you remember, there used to be these things, you go to Walmart and there were these poster boards and they would just be shapes, geometric shapes on this poster board. But if you stared at it long enough and crossed your eyes, all of a sudden, like a dancing wolf would leap out or a shark would appear or this brilliant moon would kind of pop out at you. And you, you, had, to, you had to look at it long enough and you had to look and your eyes had to do this little weird thing. And some, some of you, you swear that you saw it and you never really saw it because uh, not everybody can. But like, it's, it's this real thing. If you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go look up magic eye puzzles on Google. You, can, you, can, you really can't still find them. I was looking at some this morning and trying not to be cross-eyed for you today. Um, it's there the whole time, but you have to look a little differently to see it. We should be looking at people a little differently than the world does. We should be looking at those around us a little differently than the world does. Because the eyes of Christ, they see things that are invisible. Finally, we have the eyes, the ripple calls on us, they see the seeking. They identify the invisible, see more than everybody else does. And lastly, this one excites me and breaks my heart too. They recognize the redeemed. They, rec they recognize people's spiritual state is what I mean by that. They recognize when someone's really rede redeemed or not. So let me read you the last of the story and I'll finish up. Luke 19, 8 says this. It says, Zacchaeus. So Jesus invited himself to lunch. <laughs> After lunch, Zacchaeus stood and he said to the Lord, he said, look, Lord, look, Lord, I give you half. I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I'm gonna restore it fourfold. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save the lost. Man, beautiful. And I know most of you know, a like, beautiful ending to the story. You have Zacchaeus. And I always chuckle when I see what Zacchaeus said. And I want you to chuckle when you hear what Zacchaeus said, because what Zacchaeus is saying is ridiculous. He's the greediest guy in town. 
And he starts off what he says about the Lord. And, and again, this is a public event. At this point, you know, everybody knew Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house. Everybody's grumbling about it. I promise you, there's a crowd that followed Jesus to Zacchaeus' house. Okay, this is a public event that's going on. It's a spectacle. And people want to know what is Jesus going to do. And they've heard rumors that when Jesus does stuff like this, miracles happen. You know, people get angry. Like, you look at his stories, and this is like one of those moments, and people knew that. And so I, I believe that Zacchaeus' house, you couldn't hardly fit in it. There were so many people there. And Zacchaeus gets up in front of everybody and says, I want you to know, I'm giving half my money to the poor. Wow, that's generous for the greediest guy in town to do. And then here's where it gets hilarious. He goes and says, and if I ever took anything from any of you, any of you whose taxes I've been taking my entire life and I've been overtaxing you, if any of you say that I've taken something wrong from you, you let me know and I'm gonna give you four times as much in return. And, and the crowd's like, that's everybody. That's everybody. What are you, what? What are you even talking about? Like, that's a ridiculous thing to say. You're, you're telling me that if you took something from me that didn't belong to you, you overtaxed me, you're gonna give me four times in return. Well, that's every freaking person in the town. Everybody, did, he did that too. You're not gonna have any money left. And legend has it that he didn't have any money left. He gave everything. He gave everything to be with Jesus. And when Jesus sees him, it's not because of the money. Jesus doesn't need your money. He owns all the dimes in the hill and all the gold. Like, you don't need our money. Jesus looks in Zacchaeus' heart, and he says, that's a real son of Abraham right there. That's what it really is. Man, you Pharisees, you quote the law all day long. You, you, you sit in your temples. You know so much, but man, so many of the, you're, but you're greedy. And now we have a tax collector here. He's given everything so that he can be with me. One of my biggest problems, and sometimes one of your biggest problems, <laughs> is a huge problem in the South. And I'm, by the way, I'm so thankful I live in the South. I pick on the South a lot because it's where I live. If I live in the North, I pick on the North. Like, like, we all have our own things. But here in the South, again, can we just be honest at church and just say that we have a tendency to want to just believe people are saved because they're Southern. Because their grandmama took them to church from the time they were five to the time they were 15. Because they know some of the Bible. Because they were dunked underwater at ignite or something. We, we want to convince ourselves that people around us are fine, even though their lifestyle does not show a passionate love for Christ. And, 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 and I say we because I am the same way with my friends, with my family, with people around me. We have a tendency sometimes to treat lost people like they're Christians. And we shouldn't. We should love them. We should share the gospel with them. We should constantly be inviting them. They have a need. They're not fine if they don't have Jesus. They're not fine. And you can, you can see when someone has them because their life changes. And not only do we do that, which is very, very, very common, but sometimes, and, and again, this one is more shameful for me to admit as a pastor, but it's just the truth. Sometimes when a, when a true believer messes up, we treat that true believer like they're lost. And we shouldn't. And there have been times in my life, there, and maybe even some of you in this house, I, I've done this to you, and I want to say, I am so, so sorry. When, when someone that is a strong Christian messes up, it hurts other Christians. We, we, feel, we feel hurt, and we feel disappointed. Sometimes we feel angry because we know they know better, right? We know that we should, we're called to be better. And if you're walking with Jesus and someone around you makes a mistake, and you see them going the wrong way, it's easy to get angry sometimes even. Like, how could they do that? I know I've felt that way before. And the problem with that is that if we, if we treat people like they're no longer a part of us, we only push them farther away from us and farther away from Jesus. And I'm admitting to you that there have been people in my story that because I was hurt by them, instead of drawing them in closer, I pushed them away. We're supposed to be family. We're supposed to be family. And guess what happens when you're in a family? When you're, when you're in a family, people mess up and they disappoint you and you gotta love them anyway. People are gonna hurt you and they're gonna stab you in the back, but you gotta bring them in anyway. People are gonna disagree with you and they're gonna think you're dumb. And if you've been around me long enough, you know sometimes I am dumb. Everybody can say amen to that. Like, and we gotta bring them in anyway. There shouldn't be any reason for anyone who is a Christian to be distant from us. We're supposed to draw each other in. 
But sometimes we, we, we don't see rightly. And so here's what I want us to do as we finish up our time together today. Um, as we celebrate the transformation that God brings to a life like Zacchaeus. I want us to pray. I mean, really take some time to pray for, for two categories of people depending on who you are. Firstly, man, can we, can we really pray? I mean, really pray for the people that we know and love who we're not sure how much they know and love Jesus. We're not judging them. We're not setting ourselves on this high standard above them. I'm not trying to say that. But there are people in your family. There are people in your neighborhood. There are people in your work. There are people, maybe even in your small group, that, yeah, they're good people. They're good people. But you don't know if they really love God and are God's people. And we just need to be praying for them. We need to love them enough to pray for them. And then secondly, if you, if you know of any people that you have kind of pushed away because they're going through something right now, and you just don't even know what to say to them right now, you don't know how to interact with them, but, but they're a part of the family of God. And, and, and since I've said this, you're kind of feeling like, you know what, I need to, I need to call them. I need to, to reach out to them. I want us to pray for them too. And so um, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have um, some incredible people come up and just do some worship, but we're not gonna put words on the screen for you because isn't, this is not a time for us to sing. This is a time for us to pray. And so if you can, I want, I want you to get up and I want you to come to the altar and I want you to pray with me. Pastor Chris is gonna finish up our service, but I'm gonna be down there at the altar. And I just wanna invite you, it, you can pray where you're at, but, but take a little bit of time and pray. Pray for your coworkers, pray for your friends. And if you're here and, and you don't know Jesus, man, I want you to know we're praying for you. And we believe in a God that in a moment can take a Zacchaeus and he can transform his story. And we, we want your story to be transformed as well. And so we're gonna have this time of worship and prayer. Chris is gonna finish our service. Our, our prayer team is gonna be available once everything ends. Take this opportunity to call out to heaven and to see the people in your sight that God has his eye on and wants to be a part of his family. So I invite you to the altar. Let's come together and let's pray.